address to minute address number one, which is Julia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the first thing I'll say is that I was actually um, given a warning from one of the other candidates that I shouldn't show my face at this event this evening. But I uh, decided to come anyway, because I think it's really important that you find out my feelings on the NHS and also the feelings of UKIP on the NHS. And I've no doubt whatsoever that many of you would have heard lots of UKIP policies about the NHS. And um, you've probably heard a lot of these policies from um, the political establishment, the three main parties. And you won't be completely surprised to hear that they don't always tell the truth about, uh, about what we say and what we, um, what we really believe. So one of the things I will try and do this evening is be completely honest with you and try and set the record straight where appropriate. And, um, you know, I've been very uh, sort of clear about the fact that I'm not really going to take lectures from the three main political parties when it comes to the NHS. Because uh, you know, these, the political establishment has given us you know, around 300 billion cost in the PFI. We've seen a top-down restructuring of the NHS, which is largely regarded as a failure. And, um, and of course, while they all continue to govern in the way they do, we will have no choice about TTIP, the transatlantic trade deal. <coughs> while we remain part of the European Union, we will get that whether we like it or not, which I think most of you will agree is not going to be good news for our NHS. And uh, the final thing I'd like to say in my last 30 seconds is um, over the next five years, you're going to see a lot more UKIP people elected. And um, one of the things that I would urge you to do, instead of judging us on what the others say, judge us on what we actually do when we get there. Thank you very much. Hello, um, I'm Donna Tristram. I am the PPC for the Green Party. Now, two minutes doesn't sound like a lot of time to say what we do in the NHS. Conveniently, of all the parties here, we have a set of policies which you can read. Um, covers everything in detail. But well, let me summarise like this. The first main point is that we will increase health spending to be at least the same as the European average. We're told a lot at the moment, oh, the NHS is unsustainable, oh, it's too expensive. <laughs> we spend less on healthcare in this country than everyone else, almost everyone else in Europe, and certainly less than everyone else in the OECD. It's about 9.3% of GDP. Most, the average in Europe is 10%. Now, that 0.7 doesn't sound like a lot, but it's billions of pounds. So we would actually say, as a party, we should spend at least the European average. That isn't much, is it, really, to, to ask, but that's what we want to do. That would be a huge increase in money. Um, the second thing we want to do, which is a very major way we will save billions and, and put more into frontline care, is to scrap the internal market. Yeah. Now, I, as far as I know, we're the only party that actually wants to do this. It's as simple as that, scrap the internal market. You lose all the bureaucracy, all the sort of, you know, much maligned pen pushers who actually do a value, I'm not going to knock NHS managers because they do a very valuable job that the government has demanded they do, but ultimately it's a waste of time because to have one hospital competing against another hospital is a false market. Markets do not allocate health care efficiently, as we've seen, as I'm sure will be mentioned tonight. NHS is the most, well, certainly one of the most efficient healthcare systems in the world, or certainly was until this coalition came in. So just get rid of the internal market, or we'll save billions. There's loads of other things we want to do. Um, we want to get much more care into the community and out of hospitals. It's all freely available on our website. Anyone can read it, policy.greenparty.org.uk. So I won't have to say it about it here, but let me just finish with this. It's all about the people, not profit. We don't believe that private healthcare has any place in the NHS. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Bradley. I'm the Liberal Democrat candidate. And like all of you, I am proud of our NHS. Um, it's the number one health service globally, and rightly so. Uh, but as we all know, uh, it's also an institution that is facing a financial time bomb. Um, as our population ages, as illnesses get more complex, as drugs and equipment get more expensive, so too the funds we need to keep our health service the best in the world are increasing. Now, you're probably aware that the new Chief Executive of NHS England recently revealed that um, by 2020, a further £8 billion of funding will be needed 
to keep the NHS sustainable. Uh, and he's challenged all the political parties to commit to providing that. Now, this evening we're going to touch on, I'm sure, a lot of issues in the NHS, but I just want to give you a quick flavour of three things uh, that are important to the Liberal Democrats and to myself. <coughs> Firstly, the Liberal Democrats are the only party that has listened to the NHS on funding. We have committed to provide that 8 billion extra funding per year, and we have a credible costed plan for how we would do that. And I would challenge the candidates from all the other parties tonight to reveal if their party will also do likewise with a credible plan. Secondly, we have fought, and I'm very proud of this, we have fought in government to remove the discrimination against mental health. One in four people in this country will experience mental health every single year. We've already done quite a lot to create more parity of steam in government between mental health and physical health, but I want to do much more, and it's a commitment we have if we're in government again. Thirdly and finally, we want to prioritise prevention of illness. Better job of services, better integration of health and social services, ensuring we have better, uh, um, better access to GPs at evenings and weekends, and also interestingly some new ways of working, such as social prescribing, all ways we can prevent ill health. Now, all parties here tonight will tell you the NHS is safe only in their hands and we can't all be right. So I would suggest listen to the NHS, not to the politicians. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Ben Howlett, uh, I'm starting for the Conservatives in Bath. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I've worked with the NHS now for seven years, of which six of those years I've worked with the RUH and the MIN locally. So uh, what you will not find as someone who's worked under both New Labour and also under the Coalition Government is an absolute rapturous uh, applause of the Health and Social Care Bill from me. Um, I think it got there to an extent to put um, uh, healthcare professionals at the heart of the uh, healthcare uh, system, but I think it needs to go an awful long way in order to solve a massive problem which we're all facing. And to be frank, I think all political parties, my own involved in that as well, has been darting around the subject for far too long, which is quite clearly in 2020 we've got a £30 billion black hole in order to fill in the NHS. A £2.5 billion mansion tax, a £8 billion uh, funding gap, which the Liberal Democrats announced today, will not still solve £30 billion worth of uh, black hole. So that means there needs to be radical um, arguments that need to be made. And to be frank, I don't think any politician has been willing enough to actually level that to you, which is the ultimate argument. Are we to end up increasing your taxes or are we going to end up finding money from other sources in order to pay for that? If I become your MP, I'm willing enough to end up saying that to you and I will not scare away from that argument either. Um, you wouldn't necessarily expect that from the stuff you might see on the TV, but I'm more than happy to do that. I have a real reason for that. Uh, my mother has been disabled now for 20 years without the NHS she uh, would not have the same quality of care, uh, sorry, quality of life as she uh, has had. And in 20 years' time, I'm very concerned that people like her, people like my grandmother who passed away in one of the uh, worst uh, performing NHS trusts anywhere in the UK, which was Colchester, um, have had, uh, will end up with an even worse quality of care as a result in 20 years' time, unless we make that action quite clear now. And uh, to be honest with you, if Margaret Thatcher was unwilling to make that argument in 19, uh, 1981, uh, that was 30 years ago, we have to make that argument today to save the NHS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much um, for coming. I mean, it's fantastic to see... No, that's fine, don't worry about it. It's fantastic to see so many people here who obviously care so much um, about the National Health Service. And of course, this election is a fight um, for our NHS. And who better to fight for it than the party that created our National Health Service, the Labour Party? Now, Nye Bevan once said, the essence of a satisfactory health service is that the rich and poor are treated alike, that poverty is not a disability, and that wealth is not an advantage. This idea goes right to the very core of our NHS. These are NHS values, these are Labour values, but they are also British values. And these values will not change. But under the Tories and Lib Dems, the NHS is changing. And as you all know, it is changing for the worst. But Labour has a plan for the NHS 
A plan involves the completion of Nye Bevan's vision, the integration of health and social care. And that all starts with the repeal of the Health and Social Care Act of 2012. We'll invest £2.5 billion a year to fund 20,000 more nurses, 8,000 more GPs, 5,000 more care workers and 3,000 more midwives, all paid for by a tax on homes worth over £2 million, a tax levy on tobacco companies and a crackdown on tax avoidance. We'll guarantee a GP appointment within 48 hours, a one-week wait for cancer tests and results. This is how we rebuild our NHS. This is how we put patients before profit once again, and this is how we ensure the restoration of traditional NHS values within a 21st century modern health service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, as a new panel member this evening, I'm delighted to be here. Florence Nightingale said, words ought to be distilled into actions, and actions which bring results. I worked in the National Health Service here in Bath for 25 years, in GP practices and at the Royal United Hospital. We all have witnessed the kindness, dedication and compassion from staff in health and social care across the city, which was Florence Nightingale's ethos. In the 1970s, whilst working in the health service, I recall being asked to return to work early from maternity leave to help colleagues due to staff shortages. And in the 1990s, whilst running radiotherapy oncology outpatients at the Royal United, I was asked by the then Chief Executive, Barbara Harris, for additional admin support. I asked her, I begged her, and she said, due to limited resources, this was not possible. So I continue to work the extra hours I'm paid. It is evident that these issues are still very pertinent today. People should not be expected to continue to work extra time and with all this underfunding. It is important that people have a work-life balance. The staff in the RUH and across the whole of the National Health Service really, really deserve this. In 1995, when elected as a councillor, I was assigned to social services and in 2010, following the present government's directive to amalgamate health and social care, Saroma Care and Health was set up. <coughs> health and social care teams working together could be a benefit to patients. This can help ease the transition from hospital to care, whether care at home, nursing care or extra care. I believe that where possible, people if they wish should be able to stay in their own homes and social care is vital in enabling this to happen. We need to ensure that the NHS receives the investment it requires to continue to provide an excellent service. I think that was exemplary timekeeping, so thank you for that, um, because that was a big, big ask and you stuck to it. Okay, um, there are going to be now two questions from Protect Our NHS, and the first one's coming from Paula Riseborough. Okay, here's a question probably um, to Ben in the first instance, and yeah, to Ben, and I'm sure others will want to come in on it. Uh, in 2010, the NHS was ranked at the top of international tables for efficiency, safe and effective care, and value for money, while making huge progress in key performance indicators, such as cancer survival rates. How can privatization and marketization of health services which impose huge bureaucratic and administrative costs on the NHS, improve on value for money without sacrificing quality of care? Okay, in answer to that question, I kind of uh, alluded to it in my opening statement, which is ultimately uh, the Health and Social Care Bill did, as I said, uh, put at the heart of the healthcare um, needs of the local people, the doctors uh, and the healthcare professionals. To be frank, I don't think politicians uh, have understood the NHS um, over decades, really. And I personally would like to see an empowerment of doctors, nurses, and also to go uh, one step further, which would be to see that secondary care providers are also brought into the GP commissioning model as well, much more effectively than they currently are. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the fact that, in, I might not be very 
very popular by saying this, by the way, um, but I don't necessarily agree that increased marketization leads naturally to bureaucracy. Actually, as you can see, as a result of the NHS Health, NHS Health and Social Care Bill, there are actually now 7,000 less managers in the uh, back offices of the NHS, whilst uh, at the same time there has been an increase in uh, doctors, nurses, midwives, etc. And I can give you the statistics on those if you'd like. Um, but uh, really, in terms of improving the, and uh, encouraging the next steps of the NHS, and I'm very concerned, to be honest with you, about this £30 billion black hole, um, doctors, nurses, um, uh, healthcare professionals need to be much more involved in this process so that there's a much clearer line of communication between uh, an A&E department saying, oh my goodness me, we don't have enough resources coming in, and the commissioners that are funding it. And I think that's a much better way of working rather than having politicians darting around all the time saying that they know all the solutions to the healthcare service. Trust me, seven years of working with the system, they really don't. Um, I, actually, I think maybe as you've, your party's been part of government, we should ask you to answer this as well. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Um, Paul, I, I mean, I just three points I would make. Firstly, um, privatisation, if you wish to call it that, uh, the involvement of non-public sector organisations has, has been happening for many years in the health sector. It began under Labour. The first uh, private hospital in the country, uh, Attenbrook in, in the Cambridge, was actually commissioned by Andy Burnham with a £1 billion contract. Um, currently, 6p in every pound is, is provided through non-public sector uh, companies. 5p of those were done under the last Labour government. Now, within that, there are also some new models, and it's not all private companies. Um, so the second point I want to make is, for me, I'm really much more interested in the patient experience and the quality of care more than who provides it. I don't want to take a dogmatic view of health. I don't want to believe that only the private sector can have all the answers and nor do I want to believe that only the public sector can have all the answers, because as with most things in life, the truth is very often much more complicated than that. And I mentioned new models, for example, Serona, which was mentioned earlier on, a fantastic organisation that provides integrated social and health care in the Bath and North East Somerset area, doing a fantastic job as an award-winning organisation. It's a social enterprise. It is not a private company, but it's also not a public sector company. So we've opened up for new models to come in. So I don't want to take a dogmatic view, I want to look at what is best for the patients. And finally, the NHS, as I mentioned at the beginning, has said it needs £8 billion every year. We will not get the value for money and the safety and the other issues unless we provide that. The Liberal Democrats are very clear, we will provide that from 2020 onwards. No other party has said they will do it. Um, can I just come in there? I've, I've got three people at okay. least waiting It was just because Steve in. made the point about Labour's record, I just thought I, I should probably clarify. <laughs> um, I, I don't need the mic, it's okay. Um, first of all, Steve, um, so your suggestion that Hitchinbrook was privatised under Labour it is completely inaccurate. In fact, it's just wrong. Um, when we left, Andy Burnham signed the contract. When we Burnham signed the contract. When we left, when we left office, there were three providers who were who were um, who were bidding for the Hitchinbrook contract. One of them was an NHS provider, they were a public body. Under our system of the NHS always being the preferred, the preferred choice of provider, that contract would have gone to an NHS, to a public body. Under the coalition, that contract instead went to a private sector provider. And therefore, I think, Steve, you'll find that actually it was the Lib Dems and Tories that privatised Hitchinbrook <laughs> and not Labour. With regards to um, <laughs> Labour's record, what? Okay. I think I, uh, it's, we're it's, going it's to just, be all, all evening okay. on the first question, if I know. And, and I'd like to let you come in on the next question, if, 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 if I can kind of share yeah, things fine, out a bit. Fine. There is no agreement on this account, that's all, and we can't keep having an argument about that one thing. Um, could I now take a question from Barbara Gordon, please? Thank you. I'm not really sure who to address this question to, actually, but as Dominic hasn't said anything yet, I'll, I'll try him first. Um, what are the implications for the NHS of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the, the trade deal that's currently being negotiated between the EU and the US, and otherwise known as TTIP? And is it realistic to suggest that the NHS can be excluded from the agreement? Um, 
Next one. Hello, yes. Um, TTIP, as I'm sure some people are aware, has caused concern with the NHS. Um, just briefly, the Green Party position is that we don't support it at all. Um, some parties support it, some want to exclude the NHS, we don't think it should exist at all. Um, our reasons are because it does very much threaten the NHS. In fact, it threatens any public sector service in this country. Um, this isn't just rhetoric, this isn't just scaremongering. Uh, we know what has happened in the past similar trade deals. For example, um, Slovakia had a, a, voted a, a government that said it would re renationalise its healthcare system, and it's now being sued for £30 million by a Dutch private healthcare company. I mean, these things happen. TTIP sets these, um, these processes up, and basically what they say is, if, if, something, if government legislation costs a private company some money, then that company can then sue that government, which is entirely undemocratic. There is a reason why, you know, our government says, oh, don't worry, the NHS won't be, um, you know, it won't be, it won't be affected by TTIP. Oh, but we're not going to ask to exclude it from TTIP. So why would the government do that if it was really sure that TTIP wouldn't affect it? Obviously, it's a lie, um, and that's all I can say, but it's a lie. <laughs> Um, in relation to, uh, to TTIP, it's something that I and my colleagues in UKIP are very, very much opposed to. Um, in terms of the finer details of TTIP, it's very, very difficult to answer a question on that because we don't know what they are. Um, the, the, the sort of finer, small print of TTIP is still very much a, a secretive document. And uh, the sort of sad reality is that democratically we won't get a vote, or we won't get a right to vote over whether we are subject to it or not. And I think it's, I think most of you will agree that it is going to be very, very damaging for the NHS. Let's not, you know, let's not forget that this is a, a transatlantic, this is a deal with America. You know, when you look at the United States and their spend on healthcare per capita, it's, their spend is extremely, extremely high because so much of their health spend relies on, um, you know, on private companies. So um, TTIP, I think, is, is very, very bad news. And uh, I really wish that we had a way of, of voting to, to, you know, to get rid of it. But sadly, at the moment, that's not the case. I think I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm debating in my head, should we be hearing somebody who's got something else to hear it say about TTIP, but I dare say we'll come back to it, so I'm going to move on. I can see the first question there, blue shirt. Uh, um, I was just wondering, um, very quickly from each of the candidates, uh, did you support the NHS workers when they were on strike when faced with a real terms pay cut, and was it right that 64 Conservative MPs and six Liberal Democrat MPs were profiting from their involvement with private healthcare. And also, Julian, can I just assume that this week is a, is a keep the NHS public week for UKIP, not private, <laughs> like it was last week? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to struggle rather with, I want a question from each of the candidates when you've got loaded questions for them, but um, is there anybody who has... Thank you very much. Um, having worked in the NHS for such a long time, so a large part of my adult life, 25 years, I would totally support all my former colleagues, all the people in the NHS, all the staff that do such a fantastic job. And very often, you know, we know that they are really struggling, they're putting in extra hours. And as I said earlier, what about their quality of life as well? And I have grave concerns for that. So I think we have to say enough's enough and let's make sure that people receive the proper wage that they should get for the, the job that they're doing and the hours they put in, the unsociable hours that they put in. Like my sister works in the health service and she's a, she's a matron and we hardly ever see her, and her family are, are, hardly ever see her. Her husband's a police officer, so you can imagine they both do ship work. They go weeks where they don't actually see each other, so I totally would be supporting NHS staff uh, who do need to have pay rises and, and be rewarded for the marvellous job they do. Thank you. So briefly, to answer the question, yes, I did support them. I was on that picket line, I was on both those picket lines, and I, I, oh, and I fully support any NHS strike for fair pay. It's ridiculous what's happening. They haven't had a pay rise for five years. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yes, I did support the strike. Um, I was also out on the picket line with NHS workers. Um, and I, um, it is absolutely inexcusable um, that the government refused to accept the 1% recommendation um, for NHS um, pay. Um, with regards um, to the fact that Tory and Lib Dem MPs have actually individually profited from the privatisation and the sell-off for our NHS, again, absolutely inexcusable and very worrying as well. Um, of course, as I said in my introduction, we'll repeal the Health and Social Care Act, restore um, accountability and end the free market experiment in our NHS. One of those questions was sort of directed at me, so I'd like to sort of just... Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, very much was, yeah. Just the... <laughs> yeah, just, just the, the, the little bit at the end. Okay, probably what you're referring to, and I'll ask for a show of hands here, you, you might be referring to this famous video of Nigel Farage from 2012. Who's watched that video of him standing up and saying that he wants a, um, you know, an insurance-based system? Yep. So let's, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, it'll have to be very short. It'll have to be a very, very, a very, very short minute. I'm gonna, I just want to address the gentleman's question. Um, he did say that, and I'm not going to sort of try and deny that or try and pretend he said something else. Um, what we've had within UKIP is something called an internal democratic debate within our party. Um, Nigel Farage is not the only member of UKIP. No, no, it may, it, you, you may laugh, but this is, it may, it's alien to the political establishment. But let me tell you. You've just... Here and now, let me finish. Yeah, um, yeah, you just... So, Please, no interruptions. So, uh, sorry, that gentleman just flicked his V's up at me, which I thought was um, absolutely charming. But anyway, Can you just carry on? Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Um, so effectively, you know, our policy is, is very clear that we want a publicly funded NHS, and an NHS that is free at the point of need, and that, you know, is our official party <coughs> policy on it. And it's something that we've, you know, had an internal debate, which is something, thank you, that the other parties could learn a lot from. I'm going to let each speak this time. I'm only going to pick up on two quick points on this. One, I don't think MPs should have second jobs at all, because your number one, uh, uh, sorry, the number one people that you are there to represent is not a private company or any other type of company. It is the residents of Bath, if I do become the MP, and hopefully everyone across this panel would uh, agree that they will not take second jobs too. But also, second of all, um, I'm a big advocate of the voluntary living wage. Now, Boris has introduced that in London at the Greater London Assembly, and actually I think that could be something that we need to look at when it comes to our NHS as well. And I would agree exactly with what Lorraine said earlier on. Uh, that hasn't been at the forefront of many people's agendas. Uh, I have written uh, a number of times to the Secretary of State for Health to come to Bath to discuss that with nurses directly, and I'll continue on doing that as well if I do become the MP too. A uh, couple of very big points for me. I mean, absolutely, uh, the staff in the health sector do a fantastic job. My sister is currently recovering from a, um, a uh, operation for leukemia. And we're waiting to hear if, if her body has, has rejected a new bone marrow. Uh, that's given me really close first-hand experience via the family and directly with the quality of staff we have in NHS do a fantastic job. I want them to get the pay that they deserve for their job. The person who runs the NHS has made it very clear but the way to do that is to provide an extra eight billion pounds a year. The Liberal Democrats have said we will provide that funding, and we point out exactly how we will do it. No other party, and none of them address my challenge of saying tonight, but they will provide that eight billion either. Listen to what the NHS says it needs. And secondly, um, absolutely I, I agree. I uh, echo the point that we made about MPs profiting out of the healthcare system, but also think there's another second important point, and it's to do with donations. Who donors are? There's too much big money in politics. There are a large number of organisations, hedge funds who own health companies and health companies themselves, who, who are very large donors to the Conservative Party. Circle Health, for example, based here in Bath. Some, some of the people who've been given donations and involved in the health sector have been made peers by the Conservatives in the House of Lords. We need to take big money out of politics so we remove any suggestion, any, any hint that there could be influence being bought that way. And that's something the Liberal Democrats have been pushing for a long time. It's been stopped by the Conservatives and it's also been stopped by Labour. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm unhappy about the. I'm unhappy about the Conservatives and Lib Dems uh, having uh, interest in the health service. But I understand that two, uh, if not more, of the last Labour government are now working for health care 
profit companies, in particular Patrick Hewitt and uh, Alan Milburn, I believe. So I think this one we really can yeah. give to the Labour Party That's just so we don't have to go all down the road. Right. Well, I'm, uh, Alan Milburn is no longer an MP, um, so I mean, no, it's either way, what, what but he's... But they've got where they what, are, uh, through being... Yes, but there, there's a distinct difference between being in government, being accountable, and representing um, people every time you sit in the Commons, and, and obviously, I mean, I don't, not, don't agree with that, but at the same time, there, there is a difference there. So, um, but I, I agree, obviously, it, it, it's, it's obviously concerning. Um, but with regards um, to, to, to Labour's record on the, the NHS, um, obviously when we came into government in 1997, the NHS was in crisis. When we left office in 2010, the NHS was running at record satisfactory levels. Um, and now any incoming Labour government in 2015, thanks to Tories and Lib Dems, will find an NHS in crisis um, again. And with regards to um, Labour's record, um, and the private sector. Um, the role of the private sector under the Labour government was distinctly different from the role of the private sector under the current government. The private sector under the Labour government <coughs> supplemented existing NHS services and filled the gaps. In other words, they provided services um, where an NHS, where an NHS public body was not able to provide that particular service. They did not have the capacity to provide it. Um, the private sector was brought in in an effort to reduce waiting times and that's something um, and that, that's something we, we achieved. Now private companies are actually running NHS services for profit. That's privatisation and that is the difference. A question for... Can you hear me? A question for Ben Alvin. Under the Conservative proposals, if they are re-elected, they are going to increase the amount of cuts. They're going to increase the proportion of the deficit they reduce by cuts and less by taking taxes. How do you think you can solve the problem of the NHS underfunding <coughs> without increasing taxes? <laughs> Absolutely, my point of my argument earlier on, which is that too often all the political parties have been avoiding that very debate. Um, the Conservatives have labelled um, a proposal uh, in their manifesto um, and they have already said that they would commit themselves to the uh, Stevens report, which we'd already alluded to earlier on, which would look at making, I have to say, another £22 uh, billion pounds worth of savings. And I'm not going to sort of deny that that is the case. That is the case and it's um, actually been uh, applauded as a report by the NHS itself. Um, I'm not saying that uh, the NHS by any means is um, efficient. It's not, I have to say. It's been neither efficient under the previous government and it certainly hasn't been uh, efficient under this government either. And uh, funnily enough, the reason why I um, have been working with the RUH and the Mineral Hospital is because I've been working with them to make efficiency savings. You know, for example, why on earth is it the case that you have got um, 12 knee contracts across the entirety of the South West it's the same bloomin' knee they're buying, but they've got 12 contract managers, 12 HR departments behind it, mass bulk purchase, and that's a really good opportunity to create uh, efficiencies of scale. Who on the panel is in favour of a wealth tax? <laughs> <laughs> so that's to the whole panel, and I will allow it to be answered by the whole panel if they all want to speak, but briefly. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> um, well, I mean, obviously, as you said yourself, building on the last question, so in terms of how can you solve the NHS funding crisis without increasing taxes, well, you can and are our plans... Uh, you had a question. Prove that. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting proposal. I mean, it's... it's um, we, we have said that we will... I, I, it's just because the gentleman said that obviously it was, it, was, it was a branch of the last question. So, um, it, it, it's personally, um, it's something I, I'm, I'm in favour of, yes. I just I just absolutely, totally agree and I think 
you know, we do have to say where are we going to get the money to be able to provide um, these fantastic services for all our residents across the whole of this country. And if that's one of the ways to do it, then let's do it and let's make, continue to make the NHS brilliant. The Liberal Democrats have a long-standing commitment to shifting the burden of taxation away from what we would consider to be positive things, employment, investment, hiring people, onto unearned income. So an example which you probably heard of quite a while ago was some, what some places called the, the mansion tax, but we call it the <coughs> high-value high property tax. Um, if, you, if you try and tax very rich people, they can move their money away. The one thing they can't move is their very wealthy properties. That's why we very clearly said we need a system of ensuring that we can take from those who have the broadest shoulders, and one of our proposals to do that is through a higher value property tax. Well, no, I don't necessarily agree with that. In France, they've introduced a wealth tax on their homes, and they've just sold up their homes and moved to London. So, actually, putting my economist hat on here, tax them here. <laughs> and then now they're over here, and we're accumulating tax their taxes. It's marvelous. Um, however, if we ended up increasing wealth taxes, then it would naturally cause people to think we'll move away. I'm not in favour of wealth taxes. Actually, something that I would be more in favour of is streamlining, uh, streamlining taxation. Why don't we merge national insurance and also income tax together and use those savings in order to pay for um, social care in the future? Um, as you can probably guess, I'm not in favour of wealth taxes. Generally speaking, when they, whenever they've been um, implemented, they've not really worked very well. The, the, the example that Ben used of France, um, an awful lot of the extremely wealthy people left, and the French government have now scrapped them after we had to sort of bail out their economy due to the uh, sort of extreme failures of, of that for one of those reasons. So you know, I think it's a very populist um, policy. It certainly rings true with a lot of people. It sounds like a very good idea, but economically speaking, it's always just been a failure. There are lots of hands going up. Um, I've listened to the strategies that you've all talked about for the NHS from your different parties. Um, if there is to be collaboration towards a coalition following the election, would you commit to coming back to us, your constituents, and sharing that debate with us and hearing our views? Yeah, the reason that I'm standing as an independent PPC is because I, I can vote for policies that are best for Bath and, um, and for people who live in the city and work here in the city. And for me it's vitally important that I listen to your views and your concerns um, and take them back to Parliament because when I'm able to be a true voice for Bath, I don't have the constraints of a political party. So it gives me this strength of going into Parliament and being able to vote for the policies that are right for Bath without being whipped by a political party behind me. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, um, we've actually written, uh, we've, uh, I'll stand up, we've uh, said we're not going to go into coalition with the Tories, whatever happens, they're just too different to us, and we've seen what's happened to the Dems. I'm going to be realistic, we're not having a majority of government, sadly. Um, but if I, if I am MP, what, what we'll do is have a, something called a confidence and supply arrangement. So, um, what that means is we will stop a government falling if it's a minority government, but we will only vote with them if it's something we agree with. Now, we're not a whipped party, which means, as like an independent, I can actually vote without the party telling me how to vote. So I will vote how the people tell me how to vote. Well, I mean, um, at the moment, all the Labour parties are about, or I'm thinking about as a majority Labour government, because that's what we need. Um, but with regards to constituents' views being taken into account, I think that's absolutely vital. I know if I was to be elected, um, everything that I did in Parliament would be reflective of the views of the majority of, of my constituents, and I think that's absolutely vital. Um, but with regards to the NHS um, and NHS funding um, being, being kind of subject to, to, to any group for along the line, personally, it's something I would be completely and utterly against. The NHS is just too important. 
the, the short answer to the question is, uh, sorry, is, is yes. Um, it looks that no party will have a majority government. I think that's pretty much the one thing that uh, the bookmakers will all agree on. Um, so there may be still have to be some form of arrangement, whether it's a coalition or whether it's a looser arrangement. The last coalition in 2010 was put together over a weekend. I think that was too hasty. There was a lot of pressure applied on both parties, and actually on Labour who were dancing on the sidelines, to, to basically come to an arrangement very quickly. People were told, there's lots of books about this, people were told there'll be a run on the pound, there'll be a run on the stock market if we don't get a deal signed before Monday. Uh, there were riots in Greece at the time because of what was happening there. Um, I think it would have been better to take longer, not as long as Belgium, for example, <laughs> which can take years to come to a coalition agreement, but I think we should have took longer. Um, and that would therefore allow me, if I am elected as the MP for Bath, to come back and to gauge the views of my constituents. Uh, what I would say, even given the short timelines that, that we had to work with in 2010, the Lib Dems still arranged an emergency conference of our members in Birmingham, still got 1,000 of our members in Birmingham into a room where there was a vote taken and the majority decided to go with that particular arrangement. So we had a democratic process which we went down and I'm proud that we at least gave our members the opportunity to input into that, just as we make our policies through our members of conference. As far as I'm aware, there was absolutely no consultation whatsoever done by the Conservatives with either their ordinary members or with, between MPs and their constituents. <laughs> Not quite sure if you'll end up with a thousand people at your um, conference in next year, just in case we yeah, do yeah. end up in a coalition, <laughs> but still. Um, in, in answer to your question, uh, the world has tilted towards 38 degrees, to be completely honest with you. We live in a world now where the majority of correspondence, the majority of um, contacts that comes through to parliamentary candidates and MPs comes through from um, quite a lot of you in this room. Uh, I know a lot of you have contacted uh, us about our views in relation to TTIP, and I spent a long time uh, writing a letter to every single person that wrote to me. It was about 375 in the end, and I will continue to do that. I will absolutely be happy to organise meetings, bring you to the House of Commons either way if I do become the MP, and I've also committed uh, on a number of different hustings as well to have uh, something on my website which will probably be Talk Bath, which is an opportunity for you to say without me going through it and editing whether or not I like the comment or dislike the comment, what you actually genuinely think on some of the issues that are being debated within the House of Commons. So you are able to lobby me in a much more effective uh, way than you could do uh, by just simply writing a letter. In answer to the <coughs> coalition point, to be completely honest with you, we have no idea. This is one of the most exciting slash um, confusing elections for anyone to predict. Um, you know, you'll end up with every Conservative government minister going around saying that yes, absolutely, we're fighting for a overall majority. Yes, we are fighting for an overall majority as well. Um, and if we end up in a position where we're in a minority government, then of course all options are open. But one thing I will never do is not leave my convictions at the door if I am entering the House of Commons. I've campaigned against special needs closures by the Conservatives in the past. I have campaigned uh, against the Conservatives again on a number of different positions. I will agree with whoever I agree with on the basis of my own views. Thank you, Ben. I'll uh, try and keep it very brief for you. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm very keen on is direct democracy, and one of the things I'm a big supporter of is the right to recall. And um, Bath is certainly a very vibrant place when it comes to um, political campaign groups and things like that. And um, you know, as, as a UKIP MP, I won't be subject to a whip, and I won't be subject to being told you know, by the, uh, the boss of the party what I need to do and what I need to vote for. And I would say that even if um, some of you laugh at me, and even if one of you sticks your V's up to me, I'll still be very, very happy to come back and talk to you about, um, you know, about what's going on. And, uh, and if you really, you know, if we ever feel as though I've really failed you, then I'm more than happy for you to get rid of me. Question for Ben Howlett uh, on your election material, and there's absolutely loads of it coming through letterboxes. You must have a lot of money behind your campaign. <laughs> you, you say that you were with the uh, RUH and the other hospital in town, Min. Uh, could you be a bit more uh, precise on what exactly your role has been? And were you actually an employee of the hospitals or were you working for a consultancy? <laughs> Can I have a mic? 
Um, yes, I'll be happy to go one step further than that. I've actually also worked with uh, Bain's Clinical Commissioning Group as well as the previous PCT as well as Avon and Wiltshire Mental Health Partnership Trust. I've worked with NHS trusts across the whole of the UK actually. In 2010 I was offered the opportunity to set up a London office for a company uh, which uh, would make which would make efficiency savings within the NHS as a consultant. I have never worked for the NHS myself. I'm happy to say that I've worked with all the organisations across the whole of the UK um, and that means that as a uh, employee of 40 people across the UK we made roughly per person, i.e. each of those 40 employees, £40 million worth of savings per year over the space of four years within the NHS. And to be frank, I'm quite proud of doing that. I have the opportunity to make those savings, ensure that the NHS had a very good structure behind it, uh, had a very good organisational development plan. Uh, I'm no longer working um, with them anymore and I have given up because I'm working full time, unfortunately, to put more leaflets out of the election. Actually, sitting here, I'm, I'm a bit confused because we had quite a lot of dissociation about what's happening to the NHS from uh, both the Lib Dem and the Tory candidate. Uh, admittedly, they worked in the House of Commons to vote, so I'm giving a very specific question to both of them. Up until now, the Secretary of State has been required to provide health care. He is now required to promote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that to me is something a salesman does. <laughs> I would like both Ben and Steve to justify that change and that change only. Absolutely. I'm quite sad actually. I spent my holiday reading that particular uh, book myself on NHS SOS and um, I would actually like to see that uh, reviewed and actually replaced back into uh, the NHS. But going one step further than actually replacing it back into the legislation and creating a statutory provision, Personally, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Conservatives when I say both of these things. I say this to someone who's worked with the service. I'm saying that um, in reality, the Secretary of State cannot run an organisation the size of the NHS as an individual, as one person, as the Department of Health. I do not believe in centralisation. I believe in localism. And actually, I think the NHS needs to be a lot more accountable at a local level. So actually, all of that sort of top-down um, centralisation that has dominated the service for over 30 years, I don't think has been in the interest of the patients. And actually, I would like to see more healthcare, like we have in Baines with the Your Care Your Way plans that they're introducing in Bath and Northeast Somerset at the moment, um, introduced and held accountable at a much more local level. Could that mean we, in the long term, we integrate uh, our social care, NHS and acute services uh, all together at a local authority level? Yes, absolutely. I think that might be a very good um, long-term plan. Um, I, I'll give you my honest answer. I don't personally have a problem with a change in the wording from providing healthcare to promoting healthcare. Uh, the, I'll, give you, I'll give you the answer why. I don't believe that only the government, only the state, can provide healthcare. I don't believe that only the private sector should provide healthcare. Um, I did mention earlier there are some new models emerging. Serona, a social enterprise, I support the principle and the existence of social enterprises. I would love to have more providing services. There are new models coming through. There are also new, there are also new models of healthcare, such as social prescription, whereby people, for example, will be prescribed gym membership. They'll be prescribed to go for walks. I can't see how the state is going to open gyms and provide gym membership to do all those things. So I don't want to be dogmatic, dogmatic. I want to focus on what is right for patients and what is right for, uh, for ensuring we get the outcomes we need, which is a healthy nation. And then secondly, uh, I really do want to come back to the previous question because I really don't think uh, Ben did justice in answering it to the gentleman. Uh, ben is very welcome to correct me if I'm wrong in this. Ben was, uh, it's, he's still on the website of this organisation, so he may still be employed, but Ben was employed by a recruitment consultancy in London called Fine Green. You can Google him, you'll see him on, on there, and they say that he's the Conservative respected candidate in, in Bath. There's a list of things that he was involved in, in terms of recruitment. It doesn't mention health, he may well have been involved in it. But we've had a lot of complaints from people who have written to us to say, 
They're concerned that the Conservative candidate is saying constantly that he's worked with and for the NHS. He's been a recruitment consultant. Okay. <clears throat> Can I just come back on that? You can. Um, in all of my literature, I've never said at all, and please do provide me the evidence, the word I have worked for the NHS. I have said that I've worked with, with the yes. NHS. So can I just say, I do work with a company called Fine Green as part of what they do, and I'm a managing consultant. I do not work with the NHS, okay? But I have worked, uh, sorry, I do not work for the NHS. I have worked with the NHS and in a consultancy company. I have not lied under any circumstances, and I won't do that either. The people that I've worked with at the Mineral Hospital and the RUH, I have built up very long-term relationships with, and you can feel free to have a conversation with them. You sell them overpriced now. No. I don't mind who answers this, in fact because this has been an appalling problem all my adult life. Um, according, to, according to Age UK, each winter one older person dies in the UK every seven minutes from the effects of cold weather and it's completely preventable. <coughs> Four years ago, Bath was the worst place in the country for this. It's still way above average. In Scandinavia, the problem's almost unknown. Can any of you offer a solution, any of your parties? Um, yes, um, this isn't obviously entirely to do with the NHS, but we do have a lot of policies. Um, I mean, you're right, our housing stock is ridiculously un under insulated, and in fact, this government has backtracked on a lot of things it, would, it said it would do for building regulations. We've got, on our policies, we've, um, we want to insulate all our houses, which are currently some of the worst in Europe, up to the standards of some of the best. Uh, that includes grants and, and uh, to existing homes. And we want to introduce um, re legislation for rented housing as well, so that your landlord is actually compelled to insulate your house, and if you pay to insulate it, he has to pay you back. And we want to eradicate fuel poverty in the UK. Um, a fifth of households suffer fuel poverty at the moment. Lots of those people are old age pensioners. So what are we going to do? We're going to make sure that those bills are reduced, and we're going to give, if people need it, um, I'm not going to go into all our other policies, but let's, let's just, say that we are going to give people money to pay for the fuel they need. Everyone, no gear is going to go cold, basically. Um, OK, so obviously, <laughs> not strictly um, NHS. Obviously, it's vital that homes are insulated during winter. Um, I mean, double glazing is obviously a part of that, and, and where that's not possible, um, obviously, kind of adding insulation in, in roofs and, um, and walls as well, and, and ensuring um, that extensions or, or new builds are obviously um, adequately insulated um, is an important factor as well. But I mean, with regards um, to, to elderly people in particular having a problem when it comes to eating their houses, well, um, you may have noticed energy bills are quite high. Um, well, we've said we'll freeze energy bills. Um, that will make heating homes more affordable for elderly people and families and anyone else alike. And I think that's really important. <laughs> I actually, um, I don't agree. I think it is, there is a link to the, uh, the NHS here because a lot of the elderly people out in our communities um, are very uh, are alone. Um, and if there was more investment into the GP practices so we could have more district nurses, more health visitors out there in the community, then actually a lot more of the elderly who are really suffering alone would be identified. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the elderly that, that sadly have, have lost their lives are very often because they've been alone. And so it does link to the NHS. We do need more money in the NHS. We do need more money out in the community and that will help identify so that then all the other plans that could be put in place to actually make their homes warmer, to make their, their lives happier and to help them through the winter. Thank you. Well, it is a very sad indictment, isn't it? You know, in uh, one of the largest economies in the world, we have people dying through fuel poverty. And we have people here who have to choose between whether they eat or whether they heat. And, uh, you know, certainly in my lifetime, what I've seen is the political establishment and the Lib Lab Con, as I like to call them, bring about a disastrous energy policy that has brought prices of energy, you know, increasingly higher. And, um, you know, we've seen a massive, massive increase in the cost of living. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's a ridiculously, uh, ridiculously sad situation. You know, I think it's, it's awfully interesting, isn't it, how you know, the Labour Party have forced energy prices up and up and up. The big 12 became the big six. 
And now that energy prices are extremely high, they're suggesting that they freeze them. Um, quite an appropriate term, I would have thought. So um, I think you know, what, what, this, you know, what, what this shows is just an abject failure um, with the political class. And it's, uh, you know, we certainly need lots and lots and lots of solutions. There's no silver bullet for this. Um, but you know, a good, coherent energy policy would certainly be one place to start. Very quickly, as a lifelong environmentalist, I completely agree with the question. We need better housing stock in this country. We need housing stock which is better able to retain the heat that's in it, which generates heat, heat more cheaply and generates heat and energy more uh, efficiently and more environmentally. Um, a few things the Liberal Democrats have done in government, uh, I, I, they haven't gone anywhere near far enough, and certainly not as far as I would like to go with the Green Deal, to provide for the first time a mechanism by government to enable people to borrow money to improve the energy efficiency of their homes. Here in Baines, we've recently launched Energy at Home, which is a similar thing. Um, we've also brought in new regulations on rental properties to knock out the lowest performing. Finally, one last thing, I am an absolute advocate of community energy. I want to take away control of our energy from six multinational drug dealers, and I want to see communities in charge of the creation, the generation, and the use of their own energy. And I think when we do that and change the law to enable that to happen, then we can start having communities decide how much they charge each other for energy. Lorraine said exactly what I was going to say anyway, so it's fine. I learnt a few years ago that Tina Green, wife of Sir Philip Green, gave herself a bonus of £1,200 million tax-free from one of her seven companies. I would like to know which of the parties here would hit the FTSE 100 companies who on average pay something like half a percent tax in London, <laughs> Luxembourg or somewhere, and rake in the money which would sort all out these NHS problems out overnight. We're talking chicken feed. We're eight billion, it's nothing. I, I think that was a very enthusiastically refused question. I'm not sure how much light it's going to shed on the problems of the NHS, but it does give you an indication. I'll give you a 30 second go if you want one. Um, well, obviously tax avoidance is a massive issue, and as I said in my opening statement, um, we plan to crack down on tax avoidance and use the money saved to put it into our National Health Service. Um, 30 seconds. Yeah, well, nothing will happen as long as political parties like some of these guys get tons of money from these companies. Um, we need to go to that. So I thought we were all getting that to Well, you were, but you yeah, no, the trend wasn't out. Very, very happy. Um, <laughs> very quickly, uh, firstly, I'm, I'm still the only candidate who is saying that our party will fill the eight billion gap that the NHS has said needs to be filled. One of the ways in which we said we will fill it is by aligning dividend tax with income tax for those who earn over £150,000. If you take out money in dividend, you pay pretty much half what you'll pay on income tax. Instantly, we could double the amount of tax we take on outrageously large dividends from either that individual or other people. So that's one of the solutions we could do. And we've clearly said that will go towards filling the eight billion gap in the NHS funding. Thank you. Just, just, quickly, yeah. Yeah. just quickly to add, and the bank's bonuses as well, that needs to be stopped. Yeah. And that, then that money could go back in, into helping our communities and our country. It's been very recently reported on, I think, the BBC Points West that the NHS Treatment Centre at Emerson's Green in Bristol, just up the road, run by Circle UK, that they've identified a £7 million fraud where Circle have been charging the NHS for work they did not do. Can we have comments from the... Oh, yes. Are, are, are these people going to be, to be prosecuted? Yes, I, I saw the same report, incredibly um, worrying indeed. And I think this, to, to go back to a point um, Steve made earlier, you know, talking about the fact that ultimately he has no problem personally with privatisation, with um, private companies running NHS services for profit, and, and that's exactly what's happening in, in Emerson's Green. Well, I do because of situations exactly like that. There is no evidence to suggest that private companies provide a higher quality of care. In fact, quite the opposite. Overwhelmingly, 
actually provide a far lower standard of care and there's some real horror stories out there. I mean, off the top of my head, the one incident in Cornwall where the out of hours um, GP service was put up, put up for tender. Uh, there was one GP for the whole of Cornwall working at one time. You know, really scary stuff. Um, so, going back to your, your initial point, um, you know, I, I really hope the situation there is, is resolved um, very worrying indeed. So, I, thank you. I hope so. I, I hope so. <laughs> Under Labour, they will. <laughs> <laughs> very quickly, and I will be very quick. Um, this is why private companies have no place in the NHS. Unlike Labour, we don't think they should be there at all. They shouldn't be topping up services. Because sometimes there's, there's still the profit motive, isn't there? This will happen. So they've just not got to be there at all. Very briefly, I don't have a specific set of ideas. Absolutely, if they have been defrauding the state, if any organisation of any sort, private or public, is frauding the state, action should absolutely be taken. Will it be taken? I certainly hope so. I fear not. Um, Circle Health uh, uh, gave the Conservative Party £1.5 million pounds recently, um, around about the same time that they got £1.36 billion pounds of health service work. The parent company, the parent company that owns them, Circle Holdings, is owned by several hedge funds who themselves are major Tory donors, Lansdowne Partners and Invesco Perpetual. That's why we need to take this big, dirty money out of politics, have a cap on donations, which the main parties have, have, have refused to have, so that we don't have suggestions that these guys can get in so easily and cream the system, but absolutely they need to be held to account. Yeah, further from what uh, Steve said there, I think to a certain extent, uh, the political class do, certain parts of our political class do see the NHS as this huge cash cow that they can get their friends to, uh, to come in and milk. And, um, you know, earlier on somebody, uh, I think it was somebody over here, mentioned Andy Burnham. Uh, his, uh, you know, although he's now retired from the government, he was one of Tony Blair's um, health ministers. And he now has... The party lost. Labour lost the last session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not an MP. No, he's not Andy Burnham. Not Andy Burnham. Yeah. All those Northerners just look all the same those, to all you. Alan Milburn, let's get back to the point. Alan Milburn, sorry, Alan Milburn. It was in the Guardian last week that his, uh, you know, his company has, uh, has in increased their profits by about £600,000 a year um, due to this kind of cronyism. You know, this is, this is what the political class do. It's favours for the boys and they, and they, they take all this money. And, uh, you know, it's... it's your health service is never going to get better while this continues. And apologies for forgetting the, uh, the, the name of uh, the Labour the Labour politician. They're all, they're all the same to me. Poor quality of care is poor quality of care, but I have a, a memory long enough to remember some of the other uh, major issues within the NHS. The mid-staffs crisis that's come up, that was an NHS provider. Uh, Medway Hospital has had a huge issue there. Colchester, when my grandmother passed away, that's had an awful lot of issues. The RUH has had some amazing um, turnarounds within the last five years, but they have some issues around some of the dementia services. Whatever service is being provided, it has to be good quality. And I don't necessarily mind where the service is coming from, but we shouldn't sort of have this sort of um, myopic view around the fact that, you know, the NHS is all absolutely fantastic, which some of the panellists have said here. And actually, all services need to be improved. And I think that what we've been trying to do with things like the independent Independent inspector of hospitals, which has been introduced as a result of the reviews we introduced due to mid staffs, will hopefully put a close to a lot of these problems and improve regulation. We must improve regulation so that whoever provides that healthcare service, uh, the patients at the end result end up with good quality care. Um, I don't know the, all the facts about the seven million, but my thoughts are seven million pounds that could be invested back into the NHS. If that's go from Emerson's Green, that could go back into the RUH. It could go back into the local hospitals. It could do pay increases. And at the end of the day, I'm a vice president for the Forever Friends Appeal, and for the last ten years, I've been helping fundraise four millions of pounds to be able to enhance the RUH for the neonatal unit. Now I'm helping raise funds for the cancer care unit. That money could actually go back in and make a huge difference locally to, to all our services within the hospitals. Um, okay,
given the series of crises experienced by the NHS since the Health and Social Care Act was passed last year, what's your party's view of this legislation? Well, I don't, I'll keep this brief, although this, this is a subject that's very dear to me. This is one of the reasons why I'm standing as MP is this piece of legislation, which is probably the worst piece of legislation for 50 years. Um, David Cameron lied at last, before the last election, no top-down organisation, we all know that's a lie. They'd already written this health and social care bill at the time. Um, I read it when it came out, so I've been involved with the NHS for some time, not to claim I work for it, but I've, I've, as a contractor I've worked with lots of bits of NHS all over the country, um, and my partner works for the NHS, so I've got a very in, real interest in it. Um, as soon as I read this, this uh, bill when it was leaked, it was obvious that it was a, a general for privatisation. Um, I was in London at the time, so I went on lots of protests. I did the block bridge. It was all, you know, lots of people wrote and all the medical, um, all, the, all of the medical organisations opposed it. I wrote to Tom Foster uh, several times, saying, "Have you read this bill? Do you, you know, you can't vote for it." And he wrote back saying, "It's nothing to do with privatisation." Um, he clearly either hadn't read it or was incompetent. Um, that's that's my feeling because actually it was obvious to everyone. That that's what it was all this time afterwards, what's happened? We've got billions going in privatisation, the healthcare system's fallen apart, we've got people queuing up in A&E and ambulances, um, GPs quitting all over the place because everything's been handled on CCGs are purely a device to lay all the blame of everything on GPs. Um, it, the whole thing is a shambles. And for anyone, for Jeremy Hunt, who wrote a book in 2009 saying the NHS is one of the biggest mistakes that's ever been made, makes me furious when I see him with an NHS badge. I'm actually really angry when any Tory says they like the NHS. I mean, I don't, I don't get emotional about it, but I've seen what's happened. I'm governor of the IOH, so I see it every day. Um, what's happening, and the people who are actually suffering, and it's, well, I'll stop there. What, what do we think of the current legislation and what would we do? In terms of current legislation, it, it, it's, if we had a majority of them in government, that piece of legislation would not have been what we put forward to Parliament. Uh, if we only had 90% of the MPs, so I'll explain to you, if I, if I may finish please. Uh, what we've done is we've put some checks and balances in there to make it a fairer piece of legislation than it would have been with the Tories on their own. For example, local authority scrutiny panels can summons in private providers and hold them to account on what they're doing. The original version of that bill did not have that provision in there, and there are other ones. But our party's position, and it will be in our manifesto, is that straight after the election there needs to be a root and branch review of how that act is performing, particularly with regards to the performance of private companies, and it needs to be done before the comprehensive spending review is agreed. So we are committing for there needs to be a full review, and if we are in, in government after the election, we will be pushing uh, for a full review of the Health and Social Care Act in terms of its performance. And then what will have to be done is whatever the outcome of that is, whoever is in coalition will have to then pick up and, and do the changes required. Is that the ledge? I promise to get the name right this time. Um, Andy Burnham was uh, debating this very subject in the House of Commons um, the day after quite a important by-election. And um, he received quite a lot of support from Mark Reckless, one of our um, new MPs who had been elected just a few hours earlier, hadn't had any sleep. Um, you can watch this on YouTube. So one of the things I would urge you to do is have a look at that video and see how UKIP does actually support the NHS and the House of Commons. Thank you. We will repeal the health and social care. It's a simple fact. This piece of legislation, um, of course, a major part of it was a £3 billion top-down reform. No one asked for it, no one wanted it, and no one voted for it. Um, the Tories lied, and of course they were enabled by, by Steve's party. Um, and, um, and of course, one of the, um, the results of this piece of legislation is privatisation. Um, Two-thirds of NHS contracts have gone to private companies. That, that's roughly £10 billion. Um, so we will repeal the health and social care. <laughs> I'm happy to, yes. Absolutely. Uh, I'm happy to um, say that uh, I think the Conservatives do need to review the Health and Social Care Act. I'm not going to say 
much on that. I mean, in terms of the previous manifesto, we have committed to actually look at increased competition within the NHS. That will make me even more unpopular amongst all of you as well. Um, personally, I think there is an awful long way before, uh, a long way to go before they even consider that again. Uh, I think the first and most important thing for anybody who's looking to manage the NHS after the next election is to just stop reorganising it, allow the NHS to just get on with what it's supposed to do for at least five years we're going to save because otherwise we're ending up in a circumstance where we're continually going around in full circles. We have the same system changing every single five years and I would like to see and I would uh, continue to lobby the government on this a Royal Commission that all political parties work together and not just come up with these marvellous rhetorical points about how uh, we'll end up repealing the Health and Social Care Act because no one's actually said what they'd re uh, replace it with um, uh, apart from the Greens and the Greens at least have some convictions on that but no one else seems to have had, uh, no one else has seemed to have said that. This is a question for um, the Green you give in independent members of the panel. Um, it is very unlikely that your party will form a majority, or even a minority member of the new government. With this said, uh, the, with the barriers that the new parties that form the majority may give you, what can you actually do here in Bath to improve the NHS care without the support of the government on a national level? Independent is a really strong voice because um, we know that um, no one party is going to have overall control after the elections. And so for an independent um, MP to walk into the House of the Parliament, they're going to have a really good opportunity to be able to speak to all the parties, find out what all their policies are, and then be able to engage with them and really come out of there saying, right, I'm going to vote with a certain policy because that's right for Bath. So as an independent candidate, I've got the flexibility of, of going into Parliament to be able to truly take Bath to Westminster and take all the views and concerns and truly represent you without having a party behind me telling me what to do. So I know that it is a very strong, it, I would have a very strong voice in, in Parliament, definitely. I'm going to um, make a point for all the three of us, I think, to a certain extent. Um, if we're not in a coalition, and I won't be, uh, with the Tories at least, then actually you're better off with, a, with an MP who isn't in the governing party because you're not whipped to vote with the governing party. We can vote exactly how we think and how you think we should vote, so you're actually better off with an independent or a small party because, you know, nobody's going to make us do anything. And if you have a backbencher and the Tories with Lib Dems, they'll have to vote with their party, pretty much. So what, I mean, that doesn't help you. So vote for us. <laughs> When Dominic says vote for us, he, of course you can only vote for one of us, so uh, that's, entirely, uh, that's entirely up to you. Um, echoing what they say really, um, I would certainly vote um, for what I believe, which is very much in coherence with um, UKIP's policy on the NHS, and, and I don't have to, you know, sort of, you know if, if I don't have to form part of any sort of other organisations of that, like the whipped parties. I think that you will generally find that with the, you know, with the three main parties, they will obviously vote how they're told to. Um, but if I stood here, I can't. You know, obviously if I stood here and sort of told you I could wave a magic wand and uh, make you all sorts of promises and make it work, then, um, then I'd be lying. But I would certainly do the best I could. Thank you. A question about social care, which is clearly very closely linked to the NHS, uh, as we've seen in recent <coughs> days with delayed discharges. Social care has been underfunded for years. In the last uh, five years, 20% cuts. It's a largely privatised workforce, very exploited. Um, many of them are paying minimum wage and charge for their own travel time. Quality poor. What on earth are you going to do about social care on which so many elderly and disabled people rely? Um, well, yeah, so I'm very worried. The social care budget, as, as um, Pam said, has been cut um, by 20%. That has meant that there has been extra pressure put on the, RU, um, on the NHS as a whole, and that has had an effect on hospitals like the RUH. Um, it's had an effect on, on A&E and the hospital um, as a whole. And I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of, of bed blocking. It's something that's been talked about a lot in the last two months. It's not a particularly nice term, but obviously what it's referring to is the issue of elderly people who are left with no alternative other than going to A&E 
or just, just sitting in a ward at, at, at a local hospital. And you've actually got a situation where elderly people are begging to go home, but are left with, with no alternative. Um, so, so, as I've said, we will integrate um, health and social care. This will reduce pressure on frontline um, NHS, um, on, on the frontline um, NHS and, and hospitals um, like the RUH. Um, and I think that's really important. So, I think my time might be up. <laughs> Okay. Um, as I said earlier, we want to, we want to move a lot of uh, what's done in hospitals at the moment back into um, into the community. And uh, one of the things we want to set up is community healthcare centres, which are sort of like a, a walk-in centre that they closed here, and, and sort of like a bit of sort of um, district nurses and sort of community care for people who can who are mobile. We also want to up the budget for get district nurses back. And one thing we definitely want to do is bring um, old people's homes and nursing homes back to local authority control. Because um, I'm, I'm very sure that everyone knows pay for a decent living wage. Because at the moment you've got people coming in being paid three pounds an hour and given about two minutes for each person. That needs to be democratically controlled by the local authority as it used to be. So once you do that, you stop the bed blocking. There's somewhere for people to go. We'll increase the budget. Um, it will be much more democratically uh, con uh, accountable to the local community. And the NHS will basically do what it does best, which isn't social care, which is what it does now when people are you know, waiting to leave. But they should be treating people who need to be in the hospital. So that's what we'll do. In your home is best. Well, there's a wider picture here because once a year, every year, the government allocates a certain amount of money to the local authority for the local authority then to spend on services. It, for years now, the government have underfunded. They've never given the council enough money to be able to provide the services that the council are providing. So there's a bigger picture here in, in we need more money from the government to come into local authorities to allow local authorities then to be able to provide the services that all the residents across the whole of this city and further afield need. And that's really important. So it's the bigger picture. It's about the government putting money into local authorities to help them put the services there in place and to be able to provide everything that, that all our residents deserve. Thank you. Absolutely correct. Sorry, in terms of the question, uh, social care has been underfunded for years. Uh, a big part of the problem is it's, it's, it's part of local government's responsibility. Um, and I'm very fearful for how that could go in the future. As the gentleman over here, I think it was mentioned earlier, the Conservatives have been very clear on what their strategy is if they're the next majority government. They will for continue to cut services until they balance the budget. They will continue to cut services beyond that to create a surplus. And they will cut the taxes. Now the only way you can deliver those three things will be by major cuts in public services. And given that they're saying they will ring fence the NHS and ring fence education now, that means absolute disaster for everything else, which includes local government funding. So what we're proposing to the Democrats is to take responsibility for social care away from local government, put it back into the health sector and have a new health and social care department. So at the very least it might protect it from uh, the cuts uh, if we had a majority Conservative uh, government. Secondly, we need new approaches to looking at what we do as well in social care. For example, in Baines we've, we've got some real award winning stuff. For example, we have weekly GP visits into nursing homes and sheltered housing and that's been shown that for over 90s it leads to a reduction in numbers going into hospital in the first place. We have seven days a week social care at the RUH. So when somebody is about to be discharged, they're instantly assessed and the, the needs and what support is required is quickly determined and is put in place. We have a healthy ageing team who proactively contact over 80 year olds in Danes to check on their health and any needs and then if needs be they can re uh, refer it over by senior uh, social workers. Um, we're also doing stuff around re-ablement, re we're doing a lot of new approaches on this uh, and we need to have more of that to provide social care closer to home. And finally, I really am very supportive of us having a bigger focus within social care and the health sector in general on prevention. It's a cliche, but it is genuinely true. Prevention is better than cure. Prevention is cheaper than cure. We need to get better and get smarter about stopping people getting ill in the first place. Uh, the government has uh, put in £5.3 billion for its um, Better Care uh, plan, which um, 
that we put it in, but we ended up having it voted down. Uh, sorry, we ended up putting it in, sorry, but the only party that voted against it was the Labour Party. Now, I don't really care which um, party ends up proposing more money going into social care. I think it's very important. I think we all agree that integration will be the hot topic of the day, and all parties will say that. Um, one thing I get very annoyed about during these election campaigns is that um, there's sort of a, uh, a complete uh, sense of forgetfulness from our coalition partners in the Liberal Democrats in that every single thing that, that we have ended up doing over this entire uh, parliament has been voted in favour of by the Liberal Democrats. Don Foster was there voting with us on these things. Yeah, I have to say, there's not a lot we could have done without the Liberal Democrats. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Steve. And to be honest with you, conviction is something that will be the nature of the day. And unfortunately, your party has absolutely no conviction whatsoever. So actually, hats off to some of the parties around this table for saying what they really think, because that was utter rubbish. Thank you very much. So you won't be cutting services and giving tax cuts like your leader has said, is that correct, Ben? There will be £22 billion worth of savings mentioned. By the way, the... Can I say oh, that? No, that? no, 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 sorry. The, you both had your go. It, it was a very no. useful deflection away from your cuts which are coming down the line. I'll, I'll leave these two to, uh, to fight it out very, very briefly. On, on the subject of the cuts to the, um, to, the, uh, to the social care, I think this is one example of where cuts can actually make things an awful lot um, less efficient and ultimately cost us more money in the, in the long run um, because by forcing those people into uh, need to remain in beds in hospital it's obviously going to be a lot more expensive. So it's, in, in my view that's a cut that's been Ill, Ill thought through and, um, and, and by joining up those services you can certainly make for a much more efficient health service.